Rock Christian Church. Well, welcome to church this morning, Sunday the 14th of June. Um, just a brief update of where everything's at. I'm sure people have began to hear what's going on on the news. So just a brief update of where everything is at for us. I, I am glad to announce, and it's been a process that's come together very quickly, but I am glad to announce that we will be in a position to open our doors officially. Our first Sunday back will be Sunday the 5th of July. Now, uh, you might say, why Sunday the 5th of July and so forth? There's, there's a lot that we need to put in place between now and the next couple of weeks. So it's only this Sunday and two more Sundays, and then we're we're all back together again. And uh, the reason for that exists that uh, there's an enormous amount of stuff the government has handed down that we need to put in place. And we are currently doing that right now. There is a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes uh, at a, you know, all the pastors and everything have been kind of organising stuff with the Queensland government. What's it going to look like when we reopen? Of course, everybody's heard Scott Morrison's announcement that it's now four square metres of space. Uh, it is, uh, we need to be able to provide four square metres of space for every attendee. That's how, that's how it works. And if you are a volunteer or if you serve in any capacity, you are not an attendee, you are a, considered to be a worker. So it's uh, 100 people plus those, and it's per building, so it's floor space. So uh, it, it means, uh, to begin with, uh, the children will go straight out the back, which means we can almost operate at full capacity, depending on what full capacity looks like when we come back. We can accommodate 120 people in our auditorium cafeteria area, uh, including, of course, attendees. That includes attendees, um, as well as those that are serving. So just... I wanted to word you up to let you know we are furiously working behind the scenes to get everything ready for when we open. Uh, there will be some changes that I need to highlight um, in the beginning. And this won't, it won't stay this way, but there will be some changes that we need to adhere to. First one is this, uh, we won't be able to physically hand out communion. We will have a time of communion, but I will need you to bring your own juice and your own bread to be able to partake. We can't distribute a communal food. We won't be able to have morning tea. We won't be able to be able to have communal uh, morning tea and food. The cafe will be open. We can serve coffee. Uh, it has to be disposable and we will accommodate all of those things. Um, but uh, I just need also to begin to press home that uh, we need to adhere to what the government has for us to reopen. And the, the biggest recommendations that are coming are uh, if you are sick, if you, if you in any way have a sore throat, runny nose, scratchy throat, or any of the COVID symptoms at all, we, we tell you, you it's not an option for you to stay home. You must stay home. And uh, we, don't wanna, we don't want people staying home, but for the protection of all, we need to ask you to stay home until you are over your illness. Uh, I know it's probably the common cold. I know it could possibly be the strain of the flu, but if you could just stay away, that's the important part. Next one is this, that when you are here, we need you to socially distance still. So New Zealand now, you'll notice, uh, have gone to a point of no social distancing because they've eradicated COVID-19. Now, while we are still in the restriction mode, we need you to space out and have common sense. We will space the chairs, of course, as best we can, but we need you to also adhere to social distancing and we need you to neglect physical contact. Um, just for a period of time, if we can lay off the hugs, if we can lay off the handshaking, uh, if you can sort of wave to people and wish people well from a distance, that'd be great. Um, we need to just do these things for the moment to keep everybody safe. If you are at risk, if you are uh, over 70, if you have underlying health conditions, um, then we would, we would ask you to wisely consider whether you come or whether you don't. If you come, we will do everything in our power to protect you and to safeguard you, but we also need you to show some wisdom moving forward. Uh, 
Now, we all hope that this won't be for long, and there is no stage four. After stage three, we move to a point of, uh, at the moment, the government's regulations are, we move to a point where uh, the restrictions are lifted, and we look forward to those days. I don't know when that will be. I do look forward to Sunday, the 5th of July. I do look forward to meeting together again in person, but we need to be wise, we need to be safe, and we need to be careful. So we would ask for your prayers um, and keep... Keep all of these matters in your prayers. COVID-19 has not affected our church body. Praise God. And for that, and we would like to keep it that way. So uh, we need you to help us do that. Praise God. Uh, uh, whatever it looks like when we're back together, um, it will be a joyous moment when we're able to be in fellowship again. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our Drawing Near to God series. And before we do, just a... A quick word of prayer. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for the condition that we find ourselves in this country. I, I, I thank you for your hand of providence that sees we, we are in a very positive position in this country. Thank you for that. Father, as I open your word this morning, I pray that you would keep me from error. My desire, Lord, is to hold your word with integrity and with caution and with reverence. And so this morning, Lord, we all approach your word with reverence. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to us and to, to open our eyes and our ears. In your wonderful name, amen. Well, if there, is, <laughs> if there is going to be one sentence that will sum up the year 2020, uh, and if we can keep the swear words to a minimum, <laughs> if there's one word that's going to sum up the, the year 2020, uh, the sentence would be, Wash your hands. How many times have we heard that? <laughs> I, I, I make no apology, but you're going to hear it again this morning. But how many times have we had politicians tell us to wash our hands and, and the self-delegated COVID police that they kind of tell us you need to wash your hands and you haven't washed them long enough and you may have touched your face. Okay, we've heard all of these things and maybe we're getting tired of hearing wash your hands. Well, this morning, you're going to hear it again. That's the title of this morning's message. Because nearness to God requires holiness. And I want to read a few scriptures for you, if I can, to kind of highlight why I chose that title this morning. And Psalms 15 verses 1 to 2 says, Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. Psalms 24 verses 3 to 4 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Isaiah 1 verse 16 says, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes and cease to do evil, says the Lord. Job would say in chapter 9, verse 30, he says, if I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, that was a herb they used. And of course, the verse we heard from last week, James 4, verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, says James. Well, there you go. Scripture is telling us to wash our hands as well. I want to tell you today that nearness to God will require cleanliness. It, re it, requires a, it requires a holiness. But I want to challenge everybody this morning because I wonder whether we may have a misconception of what holiness is. Uh, when I ask you this morning, what is holiness? I wonder what comes into your mind. I wonder, I wonder how you would answer that question. And I pray that you are able to answer that question because I have one verse that has inspired what I want to say today because I, how many of us here want to see God? This is what drawing near to God is all about. It's about experiencing God. It's about seeing God. It's about tasting God. Nearness to God is measured in experience. Well, the writer to Hebrews in chapter 12, and we, we looked at Hebrews last week, but Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So the encouragement is to strive for peace with everybody and to strive for the holiness because without that, you don't see God. You don't come near to God. You don't experience God. Okay. So the question must come to us, what is holiness? And is it even possible? And this morning, 
I, I kind of, I don't want to drop God's standards because I don't think we need to do that. But for so many years, we put holiness up here as meaning many different things. And many of us think that holiness is the complete and utter absence of sin. Well, it's interesting, as much of that is, that is a part of it, that's really not all of what holiness is. And so we kind of have this lofty standard of holiness that we will never reach, but we must admire reaching there and therefore we'll never really get close to God because we, who can be holy anyway? Well, it's a good point. But I began thinking on that. And I began thinking and looking at all of the people in the Bible. And I, and I was looking at guys like Moses. And it struck me that Moses enjoyed a very close relationship with God. I mean, Moses we, Moses would go into the tent and he came out. He would have to put a veil over because his face shone. He would have to put a veil so the people did not see the shining of his face. It was Moses that spent 40 days and 40 nights up on the mountain in the presence of the Lord talking with God. He said, show me your ways. And, and, and God, had to, God had to hide him in the cleft of a rock and pass by him because you couldn't see his face. It was... It was Moses, God said to Moses in in Exodus 33, I love this passage, but but God says to Moses, you know what, I've had enough of this, I'm going to paraphrase for you now. God says to Moses, I've had enough of these people, I've had enough of their unbelief, I've had enough of their stiff-necked, callous hearts. He says, you know what, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to give you your own heritage. I'm going to give you everything that you want, but I'm not going with you. And I love Moses' response. I pray that Moses' response would be the same as our response. I I pray that we would adopt that same response. Moses says, Lord, you know what? If your presence does not go with us, then don't take us up from here. Don't, Don't take us out of the wilderness, God. Most important thing to Moses was the presence of God. He knew a nearness to God, but he had imperfections. I mean, Moses doesn't enter into the promised land because when God says, speak to the rock, Moses struck the rock. And Moses, we know there's times in Moses' life when he wanted to strike the people too. But what about Abraham? When God called Abraham, Abraham was a moon worshipper. We've covered this before. Abraham was a moon worshipper. God makes a covenant with Abraham. And even after he makes the covenant, Abraham on two separate occasions lies about the fact that Sarah is his wife and says, no, she's my sister. What about Jacob? The deceiver. Have a look at the ups and downs in his life, but also read the life of Abraham and Jacob. You will read this phrase many times. The Lord appeared to Abraham. The Lord appeared to Abraham. The Lord appeared to... The Lord appeared to Jacob. The Lord... Wow. These were men who were imperfect. Job was an imperfect man, but God appeared to him and God uh, uh, appeared to him in a whirlwind. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel saw things that the only word he could use to try and help us to understand what he was saying was the word like. The creatures were like burning coals of fire. I don't have English words to describe what I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing this awesome, glorious vision. He knew a newness to God. He, He knew a nearness to God, but these are imperfect people, you know. So I want to encourage everybody today that holiness is... Less about perfection and more about direction. Holiness is less about what you subtract out of your life and more about what you add into your life. If you have a look at the life of Moses and Abraham, they abandoned everything. We're going to have a look that holiness kind of requires that. They abandoned everything so that they could pursue God. The direction of their life went in a completely different direction. Moses abandoned everything. Abraham abandoned everything. Jacob abandoned everything. Job was stripped of everything. The prophets were hunted, haunted, and often killed for proclaiming the message of God. These guys decided, I'm going to live for God. The word holiness, what does it actually mean? Well, 
uh, it doesn't mean uh, this holy, super spiritual state of, of complete moral purity. That can be a result. It must be a result. But what holiness actually means is to be separate and to, and, and to set apart. And I'm, I, I'm going to speak more about how God has taught us holiness in a moment. But that's what holiness, that's what the word holy means. That's what holiness means. It means a separation. It means, it means a cutting. There's a divide. There's a, there's a separation and a distinguishment. Best way to understand it is um, uh, uh, for those uh, men in the room who have had the privilege of being present when their children were born. I was present for all of my children to be born. And one of the tasks that is given to the father quite often is to cut the umbilical cord. Here's this, here's this strange looking alien thing sitting there, uh, which they are telling you is your child. You're thinking, hang on a second, that doesn't look anything like me. Um, you know, covered in all this whatever, you know. And they say, here's a pair of scissors, cut the cord. And that umbilical cord, we begin to understand, that umbilical cord for nine months, or, or hopefully nine months, uh, has supplied all of the nutrients, all of the oxygen for that baby. Everything that that baby needs has come from the umbilical cord. And now that the umbilical cord is cut, something happens. There, when the umbilical cord is cut, we now need a baby to be able to draw oxygen through its lungs. And now it will drink milk and receive its nourishment in a completely different way now. And, and so holiness is like that umbilical cord. You have to make a cut. There's no going back. You have to make a cut and a distinguishment and come out and be separate. That's what holiness is. And the challenge I have before many of us today is, today the message is not, for, is not a message of salvation. And, and the scriptures we will look at weren't spoken to unsaved people. They were spoken to Christians. And so my message today is, if you serve the Lord, so many of us are like these babies, except we fail to cut the cord. Holiness is cutting the cord. Holiness is making a decision. Holiness is separating yourself. It's deciding that I want no more of the world and I want all of God. That's what holiness Holiness is. I had two examples. First one is Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Men, please hear me when I read this verse. It says in cha Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Wow. And for those who know the history of that chapter, you'll know that a 16 or 17 year old boy finds himself in Babylon in an evil society, in a secular society, amongst all the comforts and riches of the palace. I mean, he, he was to eat at the king's table. These guys ate at the king's table. They ate of the king's food. He had all the decadences of Babylon laid out before him. And, and what Daniel does is he decides, I'm not going to defile myself. What does that mean? Daniel has made a resolve. Daniel has made made a commitment. Daniel has made a decision. I'm going to live in Babylon, but I'm going to continue to honour God. So many of us today are like those babies. We want, we want all of Jesus and we want to be able to have all of our side pleasures as well. I, I still want to be able to tickle my pleasures and still be able to draw from the world. Friends, I'm telling you now, if you want to see God, if you want to know what holiness is, we need to make a cut in our lives. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That Jesus uh, was talking about, we're going to talk today about walking in the light. At Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, you know, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I, I want to challenge you today. Next week we'll talk more about this, but I want to challenge you to begin thinking about where your treasure is. Verse 22 is what I want to talk about that Jesus highlights here. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy or if your eye is good or in the Greek, if your eye is single, we'll touch on that in a moment, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What is Jesus saying? <coughs> Jesus is saying, if your eye is good, single, because this passage is sandwiched right in between Jesus saying, uh, you need to evaluate your treasure and you can't serve two masters. What's Jesus saying? 
Jesus is saying, if the eye, this is about direction. It's about attention. It's about holy intention now, because what Jesus is saying is, if your eye is good, if your eye is single, then your whole body will be full of light. What does it mean to walk in the light? What does it mean to to live our lives in a posture of walking in the light? Well, one guy tells us, and it's the Apostle John, and if you have your Bibles, please turn to the first epistle of John. We're going to unpack what it means to have a single eye. We're going to unpack what it means to walk in the light. We're going to see what John had to say, and some of what John's got to say is abrasive. Verse 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched. What's John saying? This is the Jesus we live with. We've heard, we've seen, we've looked, we've touched. With our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it, says John. And testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, says John, we proclaim also to you. So that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. How many here today are saying, I would, I would like fellowship with the Father? I bet you I'm getting some amens right now. I bet you I'm getting some hands thrown up. I bet you that's the desire of our lives. What is it to fellowship with God? Well, this word fellowship is the word communion. In the Greek, it's the word koinonia. It's the same way we get communion here, but it's, it's, it speaks of intimacy and it's about sharing a life. It's about sharing deep thoughts. It's about sharing intimate thoughts and intimate uh, uh, feelings. And I wonder how often we have that kind of relationship with God. I wonder how often our prayer life sounds like, God, I feel crummy today. God, I feel bitter about how that person, God, I missed it. God, I have this sin. God, I don't treat you like I should. God, my heart does not burn. How often are we that? You may as well be honest with God. If there is one person in the universe that you may as well just tell him all of your thoughts and feelings, it's God because he knows them anyway. But you must share them. This is, he's talking about a sharing of a life, but, but it goes further than that. This fellowship is two-way. It's us sharing our life with God, but it's God sharing his life with us. Holiness, uh, if you've got your pen, you need to write this one down. Holiness is not adding Jesus to our life. Holiness is sharing your life with Christ. Spurgeon says that holiness is not the way to Christ, but Christ is the way to holiness. This fellowship, this intimacy, this close familiarity and friendship. Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 15, he says, I don't call you servants, you're my friends. And that's a very deep, profound truth. That's not just us sharing all of the intimacy on our side. That's God intimately sharing with us. John says, I have that kind of fellowship with God. Verse 4, and we are writing these things so that your joy or our joy may be complete. Same translation. This is the message we have heard from him and we proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. As we move along, uh, we need to understand that God is light and in him, the standard for holiness is God. He is the absolute standard of holiness. You know how today the the millennials like the phrase to the max or or to the ultimate. Well, if we, we might say that if we were to say God is holy to the max, what are we trying to say? We're trying to say that, the, that there's no better, there's no greater, there's nothing above. God is the ultimate standard of holiness. Well, here's how the Jews would say that. The Jews would say that God is holy, holy, holy. The complete picture of holiness. You see, inside of God, there is not one jot, not one tittle, not one speck of darkness. 
God does not know sin. He has not sinned. God cannot sin. God is holy. Special. That's, that's another term. And God has been for hundreds of years, God has been about the business of teaching us, using the reference of himself, he is teaching us what holiness really is. How has he done that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's have a look at how God has unpacked the revelation of holiness for us. If you go back to the Old Testament, God, has, God began there and he has continued the revelation, but he begins to teach us what holiness looks like. Uh, it's, kind of like uh, it's kind of like this. If you read uh, the ordinances of the law, you will realise that there are holy feasts. There are holy days. Do you know that all of the utensils in the temple, that they were holy utensils? Oh, okay. So God's trying to teach us something. What is God trying to display to us? You know, people say the most boring book in the Bible is Leviticus, but God is teaching us how to treat him in Leviticus. You know, the priest had the priest had all these ordinances. You must, when you bring this sacrifice, you touch your, you know, you touch your, you touch your left thumb on your right ear. Or, you know, God, you, when you come before me, you treat me differently. And so God teaches us holiness. In the book of Daniel, uh, has anybody ever heard the saying, the writings on the wall? (laughs) Well, that saying comes from the book of Daniel. And we learn a lesson about holiness right there in the context of what happens there because Belshazzar, one of the leaders of Babylon at the time, he sees a hand right on the wall and it's mine's tickle, parson, uh, I think, something like that. But when it's interpreted, Daniel says, tonight your life will be required of you. What did Belshazzar do? What was so horrible? What was such a crime that Belshazzar did this and God had a message for him? Well, let me tell you what he did that was really, really terrible. When Babylon had ransacked Jerusalem, they cleaned out the temple. They took all of the utensils. They, they took the bowls. They took the cups. They took, the, they took the, 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 the knives and the spoons and all these things, and they took them away. And what Belshazzar in his uh, silliness decided that he might do is he throws this awesome great big party in Babylon and he pulls out all of those utensils, those holy utensils, those special utensils, and he treats them like they are common. They fill them up with wine. They, they fill the bowls with food. They were never intended for food. They were never intended for pagan revelry. These are special. These are holy. So God teaches Belshazzar a little bit about what holiness looks like. You have treated something that's very special as though it is very common. We're going to talk about that next week, by the way. Just whetting everybody's appetite. You have treated something very special, very holy, very different, as though it is common, and tonight your life will be required of you. Uh, what's a holy day? Well, a holy day, as we see in, uh, throughout the Jewish calendar, you've got every day. You've got your ordinary common days. Those are the days when they wake up in the morning, they go about their, uh, they go about their normal routine, and they, you know, they work, they eat. Da, da, da. But then there's a day called the Sabbath. That was to be the holy day. Oh, okay. What's so different about the Sabbath? You must behave differently on the Sabbath. You must treat the Sabbath completely differently. You don't work on the Sabbath. You don't, you don't do any of those things on the Sabbath. Why? Because you must separate this day as a holy day. Oh, okay. Well, what about the Passover? Well, all the days in the Jewish calendar, uh, there are feasts and so forth, but all of the common days are distinguished because on the Passover, everything stops. At the Passover, you you eat certain food, you you engage in certain feasts, you engage in certain practices. You don't do the common thing on the Passover days. They're holy days. God's teaching us holiness. These days are different. These days are not common. They are set apart in the calendar as special days. What does it mean to be holy? God says, uh, I am to be holy. We're going to touch on that one next week. Uh, What does it mean for us to treat God holy? Well, for us to be holy means that we are separated, means that we are distinguished. You belong to God. 
best way to understand this, and uh, I've used this analogy before, is if you were on trial right now and you were accused of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. Amongst your work peers, amongst your family, amongst your friends, amongst everybody who knows you, would there be enough corroborating evidence to convict you? Holiness says over here, holiness says there's no doubt. They eat differently to us. They think differently. They do something different with their weekends than what we do. They, they hold, they value people differently. Their family life is different. Why? Because they're holy. Much of the church today, much of the church today, I fear the challenge that rests with us is, is there really any distinguishing between us and the world? When the messages from our pulpits are all about how we need to have a new $74 million jet that can land at an airport just outside our $20 million ranch. When our Christian books are filled with having your best life now, but there's no mention of the cross. Yeah, preach that one, pastor. Is there anything different when our message is the same? Is there there anything different when our lives are the same? If you were on trial, is there enough evidence to convict you? Well, John's got, John's got some more stuff to say. Yeah? Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. If we say, if we say that we have fellowship with God, how many of us uh, fall into that bracket? How many of us, may, how many times do we sing the songs on Sunday? How many times have you sung, He is Lord? How many times have you sung, He is worthy? How many times have we all sung, I surrender all? But then on Monday, we decide that we're going to treat somebody this way, speak about somebody this way, treat God this way. Friends, to whet your appetite, the message for next week is simply this. If you treat God commonly, it is a common God you have. And it's not the God of the Bible. If you say you have fellowship with God, but you walk in darkness. Now, what does it mean to walk in darkness? Uh, We need to unpack the, the meaning of walk. Walk is our habitual daily life's conduct. It's all about our daily conduct and routine. It's the pattern of our life. So this isn't making a mistake. This isn't committing a sin. We're going to see that, that's, that, that Jesus has made a, a, a way for that. This is about tolerating sin. It's about tolerating compromise. It's about tolerating those things of the world in our lives. Uh, what walking in darkness looks like is I've got hold of God in one hand and I've got hold of the world in the other. And it's okay for me to practice this and, and still have God. God says you can't. God says let go of one or the other. Either let Let go of the world, says God, or let go of me. You can't have me and have hold of all the world. Yeah, preach that one, pastor. If we say, this is a challenge that comes to leadership first, so it's okay. But if we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, If we say we have fellowship with God, but we treat the people in our church like this, be very careful what you tolerate. Leaders, pastors, let us come before God with humble reverence. If you say you have fellowship with him or you walk in darkness, he says, you lie. You don't practice the truth. You lie. One of the boldest statements you can make to somebody is to call them a liar. 
you liar. John says, you're a liar. John says, you can't dance with God and dance with the world on the same dance floor. That's what John's saying. You can't do that. John would go as far as to say, how dare you do that? How dare you think you can dance with God and dance with the world as well, whenever you feel like. It's kind of like, God, I love you. God, I surrender all. God, you're my Lord. But today this person's upset me, so I'm going to make sure I vindictively get my revenge on them. No, that's not holiness, friends. And there's many other examples that could follow in the path of that. It's not holiness. You're not walking in the light. So what is walking in the light? I'm very glad you asked. John goes on and says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I'm going to get to the end of that verse in a moment because it's a beautiful truth. But what does it mean to walk in the light? The best way to understand walking in the light, and I have a checklist for everybody. We're going to finish with a checklist. If you're wondering what measurement do I have, how do I kind of find out whether I'm walking in the light? Well, I'm going to give you the same challenge that God's been laying on me for some time and God will most likely continue laying on me. A checklist for you. But walking in the light simply means this. It means godly living. It's a godly lifestyle. It's a pattern of daily life that is orientated towards God. It's that single eye. You, you will find that when you're walking, your body goes where your eyes are. And if your body goes where your eyes are not, It's not going to be long before you're in trouble. And before I do some kind of pastoral linguistic gymnastics here, I'm going to stop walking backwards. Jesus says, wherever your eye is, and that's what holiness is. Holiness is pointing your eyes towards God. It's having a single eye for God. It's following after God. You might drift, you might make mistakes. Well, we're going to cover that in a moment. But when we're walking in the light, the blood of Jesus allows us to be free from sin. There's a stain that we can't get out, friends. We mess up our clothes. Why do we need to wash our hands? Why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? What's the metaphor? What's going on? What is it about us that has contact with a dirty world? It's our feet and it's our hands. Jesus is washing the feet of Peter and he says, do you wash my feet? Jesus says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Peter says the same as we all would say. Well, in that case, Jesus, wash all of me. And Jesus says, you've missed it, Peter. Those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. In other words, you're clean, Peter, but you walk a dirty earth and you can't be free from the stains of the world barred by the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes as white as white as snow. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> most people here know I used to clean at the hospital. And uh, when I first started at the hospital, you have three days of induction. First day is all about hospital procedures and the layout of the hospital. The second day is all about health and safety and uh, fire safety. And if you're not asleep by then, you move into the third day and there's a whole day dedicated to infection control. I <clears throat> don't know if anybody's ever, anybody else has ever noticed this, but hospitals are enormously germy places. And if you have any form of OCD, please do not go through one of these. I I walked out of that place thinking, how am I ever going to keep this place clean? But there's 
there's something about cleaning that's ongoing. And that's what this word cleanses is. It's a present participle. This is not a one-time event and now you've got to keep yourself clean. This is the blood of Jesus cleanses. It washes you right here, right now. If your life is aimed towards Jesus, it's all about holy intention. It's all about direction. You're walking in the light as He is in the light. The blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin, cleanses us from all sin, cleanses us from all sin. Every step we take, towards God is on blood stained stones friends and it's the blood of the Saviour it cleanses you it's the same as the practices in the hospital we don't just clean once and then walk away we're cleansing the hospital because we need to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and uh Something I noticed about theatres, which kind of applies to God. Anybody that wanted to enter into a theatre operating room while the surgery was going on, what do you hear them say? Scrub in. God says, if you want to come on in, scrub in. Wash your hands. Walk away from the things of the world. Change the direction of your life. Change the desires and the appetites of your life and head towards me. Praise God. What a wonderful saviour we have. He's already made the way. He cleanses us. Of course, the end of that passage says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you say you're free from sin, you ever heard that doctrine? Oh, well, I'm, I'm the saved and the redeemed of the Lord, so I no longer sin. You're deceiving yourself. You can't move forward until you recognise how sinful you are. That's the message of the gospel. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Thank you, Jesus. How many of us are saying that this morning? Holiness is something that is achievable. Nearness to God is achievable. Friends, make the cut from the world. Friends, sever ties with the world. Stop dancing with the things of the world and single your eye towards God. You might be asking yourself this morning, what's that checklist, Pastor? I'm going to ask you seven questions and I pray you write them down. Seven probing questions to examine yourself to see whether you are walking in the light. Question one, what do you want the most? Any answer to that question that is not more of God is the wrong answer. What do you want the most? Number two, what do you think about the most? You see, the biggest problem we have in the Christian walk often is we don't know what to do with our leisure time. We don't know what to do with our downtime. What what do you think about when you're in the car and there's no one else around? What do you think about when you're walking the dog? Uh, What occupies your thoughts and your attention? Number three, a good gauge for your heart is how you use your money. Now, hear me when I say this. This isn't about selling everything and giving it to the church. This is about, it's about a posture of life that says everything I have comes from the hands of God and I am a steward of that. And that could be much, it could be little. Number one, what do you want the most? Number two, what do you think about the most? Number three, how do you use your money? Number four, what do you do with your leisure time? What do you do with your weekends? Golfers, you need to repent. (laughs) Take up fishing. I'm joking. It's not about whether we have hobbies or not. It's about what do you do with your leisure time? Whose company, number five, Whose company do you happily keep? Pardon me. Who 
whose company do you happily keep? You can tell a lot about a person by their friends and who they happily have around them. Number six, who and what do you admire? You, you can tell a lot about a person's heart by reading into who they admire. That's interesting. What do you laugh at? Number seven. What is it that you laugh at? What we tolerate and what we find funny says a lot about our hearts. What do you want the most? What do you think about the most? How do you use your money? What do you do with your leisure time? Whose company do you happily keep? Who and what do you admire? And what is it that you laugh at? <clears throat> How we answer those questions. And I would encourage you to examine your hearts with those questions, but how you answer those questions is an examination of whether you're walking in the light and what it is you tolerate in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the road to holiness has been trodden by Christ before us. I pray you would lead us. I pray for affections for Jesus to rise in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that, that flames would be lit in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, I pray. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us of our complacency. Forgive us of wanting to dance with the world, Lord God. Spur us onto holiness, Lord God. Spur us onto walking in the light. Father, I pray for a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit upon every heart. Transforming our answers to those seven questions. In your wonderful name. Amen. And next week, <clears throat> we look at the scripture that says, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. How do we perfect this holiness? says how, we, or how much we value God or what we think about when we think about God says a lot about us. Friends, I, I, I pray God's richest blessings on you. I pray God keep you. Uh, and of course, that link will be at the end of this message if you need us. www.therock.org.au slash contact.